also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and TV Channel 279. We're all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Ocasio tonight. Daniels to pay more for electricity and water beginning tomorrow. We seek an understanding why this upward adjustment has become necessary in the face of an already high cost of living. Stay with us here on Ghana tonight. The also here on your election command center, the electricity that's electoral commission of Ghana finally agrees to a live broadcast of an inter-party advisory committee meeting scheduled for tomorrow to address concerns surrounding the voters register. We have some reactions on that. Stay with us. Also, on Galamse, organized labor to decide on their next line of action after the ultimatum to government to deal with illegal mining expires tomorrow. We've got a conversation on this. There's a lot that's happening tomorrow, in fact, or expected to happen tomorrow, the beginning of the month of October. And that's going to be the conversation here tonight. As always, you're an integral part of the show. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. The campaign against Galamse is expected to receive its biggest boost after organizers of the Free the Citizens and Stop Galamse movement agreed on rules with the police for a three-day protest. The organizers denied allegations the protest is politically motivated. Some people say we have interest. Oh yes, we have an interest. And the interest is uh, Ghana. The interest we have as organizers is to, to see a better Ghana, to wake up to a day where we can defend our country against any government. We can defend our country against any happening. And that is the interest we have. As a consumer of electricity and water, brace yourself to pay more for these utilities effective tomorrow, October 1, with 3.2% for electricity and 1.86% for water. The Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, PRC, dispelled claims of insensitivity, insisting that conditions beyond the control of the Commission are what has necessitated the increment. The point is that if we don't do it now, that means that we'll be piling debt in the sector. Mm -hmm. And once we pile debt in the sector, it will affect the quality. Symbol of our inclusive and gender balanced party and government. According to the Chartered Institute of Marketing Ghana, CIMG 2023 Ghana Customer Satisfaction Index, customer satisfaction in traditional banking declined to 93% in 2023 from 95% in 2022, a decrease of two percentage points. The Ghana Customer Satisfaction Index is an annual survey commissioned in 2021 by the CIMG to establish a customer satisfaction index score for the banking industry. We are a bank. Sit down and assess yourself. What is the loyalty level of the average customer to my bank? This loyalty we are talking about, is it behavioral or it is emotional? Behavioral is, for example, when they say, we come to this bank because the name is nice. If your, your bank is that way and another bank comes with a nicer name, what it means is that they will move away. So we, we should attach more importance to emotional loyalty. The Ghana Football Association, led by President Keto Kweku, appeared before a parliamentary select committee to answer questions about the struggles of football in Ghana. Mr. Kweku led a delegation of about 20 members of the governing body to respond to a 15-point petition filed by the Save Ghana Football Group earlier this year. In his immediate reaction, he noted the petitioners had the opportunity to use other channels to make their voices heard. They have so many channels not to create the atmosphere they created in this country to address issues which are of grave concern to them. If the group had been very patient, if they had gone through the already accessible spaces or channels they have, they will realize that most of the concerns were already taken care of or were being taken care of by the leadership of the Oh, it's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, the Electoral Commission of Ghana meets the Inter-Party Advisory Committee 
over the voters register and matters arising and this is being topical over the period and the IPAC meeting scheduled for tomorrow is one that we're keeping an eye on and how things are playing out that's coming up next here on Ghana tonight there's been some expectations as well expressed by the political parties expected at that meeting tomorrow and we are hearing also that the electoral commission has now announced plans to broadcast the inter-party advisory committee that's ipac meeting tomorrow tuesday one getting to it and all the issues coming up we'll keep an eye on this one and as part of the ec's efforts to promote transparency and accountability and its engagement with the political parties and you recall that the ndc had been making this particular demand for such meetings to be broadcast live the electoral commission is listening to this particular one we remain your election command center So we got a statement from the Electoral Commission. It's going to be on the screen right now, um, detailing the fact that as part of the efforts and quote to ensure transparency and accountability in our electoral processes, the Commission with would would hold an IPAC meeting tomorrow. That's Tuesday, October 1, 2024. The meeting aims at providing an opportunity to political parties to ensure and present any findings they may have with the Provisional Voters Register, PVR. It would also afford the Commission an opportunity to present an updated report on issues it has resolved with the PVR as we speak. And to ensure that citizens are adequately informed about the process, the Commission will provide a live coverage of the meeting. That's in the last paragraph, as you see it on the screen. Live coverage of this IPAC meeting tomorrow. This forms part of the Commission's efforts to build trust in the, its processes it's also confident that the feedback from the political parties would help to further strengthen the 2024 voters register that's a, a, a statement all signed by Samuel Tete, deputy chair of operations for the electoral commission we do know that that last paragraph you see on the screen there the ndc had been making that demand if, of the electoral commission to allow for a live telecast of their meeting the ec in this statement that we, we got not too long ago have indicated yes they're going to allow for a live telecast of this what does the ndc have to say about this they're also asking that the parties that are coming in should come with their errors that they have identified the mpp has identified errors as well they say and if you recall just about a week ago the uh, general secretary of the party justin from Korea indicated they had identified errors in the PVR. They're going to present it to the Electoral Commission. Take a look. MPP has also detected some errors in the register. Uh, some including dead people in the register and some people whose name has been, uh, has been transferred or some people who wanted to do transfers but has not been uh, effected. All these things are what we are planning to send to the Electoral Commission next week based on what we have detected. And we expect the Electoral Commission to use their internal mechanism to address all those issues. Well, so there you have it. But we're going to be joined shortly uh, by uh, the Deputy Director of IT and Elections for the NDC. Uh, that's Dr. Rashid Tagu Computer. He's got joining us in a bit. Stay with us here. We'll get back into this matter here on Ghana Tonight. But coming up next, uh, your next electricity and water bills will take a lot more from you. And also more than usual and that because the tariffs have been adjusted upwards will tell you exactly why and uh, you should be experiencing this increase in electricity and water tariffs beginning tomorrow in fact it's just a little over three percent increase in uh, electricity tariffs and then also over one percent increase in water tariffs that's according to the PRC that statement that are issued over the weekend and it's one of the issues happening tomorrow so tomorrow october one has a mix of good and bad news i mean look for all of us the electoral commission meeting tomorrow october one the next thing that's going to be happening tomorrow is that you and i the tariffs that we pay for electricity and water is going to go up in the midst of everything that's happening and a lot more of you have been sharing your thoughts with us because the cost of living is already high in this country and then we're going to have to experience this but the PRC the regulator of the 
uh, that's the uh, space when it comes to uh, issues related to tariffs has been giving reasons why they did this. Take a look. They say one, inflation, exchange rate number two, and then also the weighted average cost of gas over the period. And uh, also other underlying factors, including the current economic conditions, plus the general living standards, the competitiveness and sustainability of the industry. These are the reasons that they gave for the tariff increase from the regulator of the utility space. Now, take a look at these two, inflation and exchange rate. But we've been looking at the numbers and we're going to get into it in a bit because we do know that inflation has reduced drastically over the period from over 52 percent to now we're talking within the range of 20, 21 percent thereabout. Is there justification for this? Exchange rate differentials, the city has been depreciating, yes indeed, from the beginning of this year till about June, according to the Bank of Ghana, over 20%. We're we'll getting to the details of that. Wisdom Safo, uh, our research officer here at Media Journal, has been working the numbers. We're we'll getting to it shortly. But a number of you have been sharing your frustrations with us with this news of the pending increase in electricity and water tariffs beginning tomorrow. We hit the streets earlier today, and Joe, my colleague Joe Blaboja interacted with some of you. Take a look. I don't think this should be the right time. They should impose this tariff on electricity bills and all that because per the living standard, it's not really encouraging. And also the cost of living per the inflation rates we have in Ghana. I don't think this should be the right time they should impose this. We don't even have jobs in Ghana already as, as, as the youth. And then um, increasing electricity or water bill, I don't think it, it's fair enough. It is not fair at all. They should stop galamsey. That would be the best thing. We, are, we have a lot of bills we are paying. You know, the, the, um, the, the meter they brought, anytime you buy meter, and then, I mean, it, it consumes a lot. And then they are adding this one. So, I mean, I don't think any, anybody in this world is ready for that. I believe the PRC sometimes should engage the populace before they even announce this increment. If only you, you involve you know, those who are the electricity company or the water company and then you don't really engage us. Even the consumer association, we don't feel part of it. So I'm not prepared for the tariff hikes. Well, clearly, some of you are not too happy about this. And we're yet to see anybody who is happy about this increase we're ex going to experience tomorrow. But Duncan Amoa, Executive Director of the uh, Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, is joining us on Zoom. Duncan, I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. These are the reasons the PRC gave for the announcement of the increase in utilities. That's water and electricity tariffs beginning tomorrow. If you look at the inflation, it's been reducing, but... But the city has been depreciating against the dollar. Could that be the, the major reason, the major driving force for this increase we are to experience beginning tomorrow? That would be a bit shocking because, Alfred, what we know uh, is that if you take the last time the PURC did any adjustment uh, just about two months ago, uh, the city was exchanging uh to the dollar around 15.85 today is around 16.2 um average market uh what we would have uh thought would also influence that decision uh is the cost of fuel particularly for the power sector and so if you have a situation where uh, average fuel prices that were hovering around 14.9, 14.8, Ghana a liter uh, is today selling around uh, 12.45. Uh, one would have expected that the cost of fuel, uh, particularly gas also, uh, would have influenced um, the pricing of uh, power particularly. Unfortunately, uh, power rather saw a 3% jump whilst water uh, whose treatment has in recent times come under huge uh, scrutiny and debate due to the galamsey menace uh, rather so a one percent so uh, whatever record that the PRC is actually working with uh, should be an interesting one uh, but to 
uh, the everyday mind like mine, uh, our expectation would have been that maybe the cost of water would have rather gone up uh, due to the surge in Galamse, uh, I mean, uh, business. And mm -hmm. then again, the pollution is done to water bodies and the amount uh, of alum need. Uh, hello, Duncan. Hello? But, but Duncan, uh, if, if you can hear me, I just want to find... So the argument you make is that based on what is happening right now, you are expected that water tariffs would have gone up higher than the electricity tariffs, as announced by the PRC. Yes, because you currently have a menace on your hands. Uh, we've heard the water company uh, complain variously that uh, some of their treatment plants, uh, they've had to shut some of them down, and it's costing them uh, 10, 20, 30 times what it used to cost them uh, to clean water, to get clean water to uh, our homes and industries. Unfortunately, it doesn't look as though water rather got what it deserved. Uh, if you ask me for the power sector, uh, you take out the inefficiencies in the power sector, uh, transmission losses, uh, you know, poor rev re revenue uh, collection and all of that. Uh, you would be wondering why, if the dynamics were what we know they are to be, uh, your input cost, which has come down uh, over the past two months, uh, the cost of fuel, uh, cost of gas, both on the local and international markets, have slid, uh, has, have seen a decline. Uh, the city's rate of depreciation, like I indicated, is not as I mean bad as we saw uh, some two, three months ago when. Uh, it decided to jump from the 12, 13, 14 to around 16. Uh, it slowed down a bit. And so one would have expected that even for the cost of power, uh, we could have seen uh, some stability there. Unfortunately, that rather went up uh, uh, three, whilst water did one. And so that's why I said the reckoner that the, the PURC is using uh, for these utility adjustments uh, should be very interesting. I see. And, and Daryl, you, uh, you, you talk about these issues of how the CD um, is depreciating over the, uh, as against the dollar over the period. You make reference to some stability, at least from what we do know, based on the information from the Bank of Ghana, and this is uh, the interbank rate as we see it. But then again, you will see it being much more higher at the Forex bureaus across the 16 CD mark at some point, and it's still in some forex bureaus beyond 16 cities, the least you can get is 15 city, 80 plus worse. But then again, if you look at this from January this year up until September, the part of September, as per the Bank of Ghana's data, you see it, Duncan, that January we started with 12 cities to the dollar, then it depreciated further to 13 cities, 30 plus worse, 14 cities, 10 plus worse, 14 cities, 60 plus worse. July, we hit over 15 cities at some point. That situation persisted till be sometime in August. Then we are seeing now 15 cities, 70 pesos as well. But that's not the only reason they gave, Duncan, because they talk about other issues related to the weighted average cost of gas over the period. Could, could that also suffice, the weighted average cost of gas over the period? Alfred, as I speak with you, the, the cost of gas, well, uh, one could say is a bit high on the international market, uh, but there's been some decline, although marginally. And so if it is a weighted cost of gas uh, necessarily, uh, we would have, I mean, been happy to see some, some stability there uh, because, like I indicated, uh, if you were moving from the regions of 14.515 uh, to now 16, uh, and then it's come down a bit to about 15.8. Uh, one would have expected that maybe that would inform something. But again, you hear the water company uh, complain uh, variously. And so like I indicated, even if, if there were to be adjustments, our expectation would have been that maybe water would have seen some uh, adjustment due now to the cost uh, of treatment for our water systems. But the inverse is rather the case, and that's why I said, for us, uh, whatever underlying factors is informing 
uh, these recent hikes uh, for us must be very interesting. Duncan, appreciate your time on this. And uh, interesting you describe it, but consumers are not happy, at least with the general reaction that we have monitored. Tomorrow, as expected, electricity and water tariffs will go up. And these are the reasons given by the PRC. Well, something that's going to happen tomorrow as well. That's, tomorrow is pregnant with so many issues. Well, coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, organized labor meets tomorrow to take a decision on what next in the fight against Galamse. And that's going to be hot on the banner tonight because we're already getting pointers as to what exactly is going to be happening at the scheduled meeting. Organized Labour will come out with a decision tomorrow after a crucial meeting on how they intend to proceed with their demands for government to take a decisive action on illegal mining. This is because labor unions, that, that ultimatum that they gave to government to declare a state of emergency or the country's illegal mining scourge has expired. In fact, it would expire in the next um, one hour, 40 minutes. Not much has been seen based on their, the demands that they made of government. Well, as it stands now, their position is quite clear. No state of emergency declared, then what next? But if you listen to Dr. Isaac Bampuado, we're going to hear from him shortly, uh, the, the position that they declared on that day when they give that ultimatum. It's quite clear. Take a look. This one, we are serious. You cross us, we will roll over you. We will crush you. This Galamse Minas has not got any political color. It's our, ourselves, we the people, we are going to suffer. President sworn an oath to protect our lives and protect all of us. Today, the call is that, President, you must live up to your constitutional obligation, a state of emergency, because this is an emergency. State of emergency because this is an emergency. One of the demands they were making, take a look at this, by the TUC and the CSOs. The, the president should declare a state of emergency that has not been done. Abrogation of concessions, overlapping river buffers. We haven't heard of anything being done about this. Abrogation of entry permits, allowing access to globally significant biodiversity areas. That is LI2462, that has not been repealed. It's still on our books. Um, presidential candidates should publicly declare their total support for this crisis response and regional security councils mandated to intensify enforcement action minerals commission to ramp up establishment of community mining um, well community mining schemes so there's, there's a lot that they demanded of government the topical one being the declaration of a state of emergency it hasn't been done as we speak they are lacing their boots to meet tomorrow but there's a man who has been looking into this space quite closely and also aligning with the CSOs and the TUC who have been making these demands of government. Dr. Jamal Tonzwa is a private legal practitioner. He's a lecturer at the Gimpa Law School and also the former legal advisor to the Operation Vanguard. That's the first operation led by the military, formed by government, to clamp down on legal mining in our forest reserves. And he's joining us on Zoom. Dr. Jamal Tonzoa, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening, Alfred, and good evening to your uh, viewers. So, the declaration of a state of emergency is one that you, uh, the CSOs that you work with and TUC, were demanding should be done. It has not been done. That ultimatum period has ended. What next? Well, um, Alfred, my view is that leadership is um, helpless on this matter. Leadership is not committed to a genuine, um, finding a genuine and a lasting solution to the problem. And so, if you recall a few days ago, my view was that, look, let us shape the rules. Let's take the rules from um, the political actors because you know, for very obvious reasons, which all Ghanaians know, they are not committed to this fight. And so, you know, we need to really take advantage of the season that we find ourselves in. This is a very salient matter, and we should make political decisions based on this.
if we um, really show political actors that, I mean, if you are not really committed to our welfare and our well-being, if you are not exercising governmental powers in our interest, uh, we would kick you out or we wouldn't give you a mandate. I think that would get them uh, really set up. And this is the language politicians understand. So there must be some political cost to, to this fight against illegal mining. That, that's what you're proposing. Perfect. Indeed, indeed. I mean, we are just um, about two months away from the elections. And at this point, it's the politicians that need us, the people. Um, so, you know, this is going to be our condition for deciding who would be considered to lead us. And so, I mean, we've seen that from 2017 onwards, I know people would want to take us back and say illegal mining is not any um, recent phenomenon. I agree with that. But the point is, um, it's really escalated to a, a very significant level, very, you know, the consequences are palpable. And so um, in 2017, we had the opportunity to engage this problem. We had the opportunity to either enhance our policies or, or you know, re, um, review them and, and find out how we could better enforce them. But we never really did this. And so, um, I think that we, at this point, need to speak the language that politicians understand and what, what would make them take us serious. And you talk about commitment on the part of leadership. There's been reference made to the president's loud silence on this renewed fight against illegal mining. At least over the last one month, he's had the opportunity to make public statements. And the recent being the, the GGA Awards over the weekend, all the speakers who spoke at that event, including the guest speaker from Nigeria, talked about illegal mining. The president did not say a word about it. Were you expecting that something should have been said about this, at least because of what's happening now? Well, let's be fair to the man. The man is helpless. I mean, the man is not committed to this cause. He's um, told us that... <laughs> You know, the problems that we are facing, you know, a successor would, would help us um, resolve them. So what else? He's already said that to us. But, I mean, going beyond that, if we even look at the chronology of events, as far as this matter is concerned, uh, we, I, I mean, I was still at the military academy at the time, you know, the intensified fight was uh, waged against illegal mining. And um, at the time, I remember that the president mentioned that at some diplomatic forum, he had our neighbors complain about how illegal mining activities is affecting their environment and that this was causing some diplomatic problems, um, you know, at, at, at the international level. And so if after telling us this, he says, look, I'm going to fight this, I'm going to put my presidency on the line, and he has not put his, I mean, he's failed in this, and I called for his resignation about a year ago, um, and he's still in office, and, um, you know, this problem was treated in a symptomatic manner and we have been revisiting us in a, a bigger at a bigger scale now point is what are the solutions he's given us nothing new we have the interministerial committee on illegal mining which had about 10 ministries at least um, when this problem resurfaced just a few weeks ago what did we see again we saw um, a setting up of a ministerial committee this time not 10 but five if 10 could do nothing, including the Ministry of Monitoring and Evaluation, how do you logically expect that five would do anything meaningful? And so you could, you, it's, it's just um, some sort of, you know, it's always been a charade. No, I've never really seen any serious political commitment to this problem. I mean, get, don't get me wrong. In Ghana, once you begin to speak in a certain way, you would be, um, you know, uh, aligned or placed or categorized um, politically. But this is a national matter. We, we are just really discussing it as a, a, a matter of governance. And having said that, um, Alfred, you remember that I have said that, look, what we have, and I'm always worried about the framing. For those who frame this problem as a national security problem, a food security problem, um, and what have you, I, I really have, you know, reservations about that. Because 
politicians will only pick one of these ones that we are talking so much about, and then they'll yeah. give us a short-term kind of, um, you know, attempted solution to it. It is a problem that reflects, it's a governor, governance crisis problem. It reflects some structural weaknesses in our political system and in our institutional uh, regulatory framework. And that is how we should frame the issue. And that is where we would begin getting solutions. Solutions will have to do with some sustained and coordinated actions that are data-based and which are, you know, logical and, and sound as far as policies are concerned. And so if we do not address it this way and we keep looking at the manifestations as they come from time to time and we address these symptoms, we would keep having the problem because we have not addressed the root causes of the problem that we have. The root causes are that we have a lack of genuine political commitment to this fight and we have, um, you know, structural political and regulatory problems which we must address. That's critical. That is critical indeed. Dr. Tozo, hold on a bit for me because uh, there's this news about the, the drones that you, you know, were acquired for this fight during Operation Vanguard, which you were closely associated with. Those drones are reported to have gone missing, cannot be accounted for. I don't know if you've heard that, and I'll come to you on it. But we've got, we've got satellite imagery of some of the rivers in this country and the state they find themselves in now as a result of illegal mining. You should be concerned because these are water bodies that, according to Ghana Water Company, are sources of water for all of us across the country and even down south. So if you're polluted this way, take a look at this. This is the Ancobra. This is a satellite imagery of Ancobra River. You go on Google and you type, type in the Google map, River Ancobra, this is what you see. The brown patches you see on, on the screen there are... The, <laughs> That's the Ancobra River. All the way through, all the way, wherever the Ancobra goes, you see brown. They are not alone in this. The Offing River, River of River Offing, also is it, the brown patches you see in the vegetation. Offing also gone. And look at the Pra River. The, the Pra River has been the reference point for this renewed fight over the period. This is how the Pra River looks like now. And you can just try it. Go on your phone right now. If you use a smartphone, go on Google and, and the Google map, type Pra River. This is what you would see. The brown line or patch you see there all the way is the Pra River through to um, Ongwa and all the other areas and, and the Sakura Park areas you see there. This is the Tano River. The brown part you see on the screen there is the Tano River all the way. So no river body has been spared, really, as, as we're saying. And the Tano River goes through the western region all the way to the western north. So you can imagine the number of people who, who, who are depending on... And this is the... The Bonsa River is the brown part you see on the side of it. And just close to the Bonsa River is the Ghana Water Company treatment plant. So you're right to think that this polluted Bonsa River is where the treatment plant gets the water from to treat to provide water for the people who depend on water from the once clean Bonsa River. This is how the situation is. And this is troubling, uh, Dr. Tonswa, to say the least. You, you've caught wind of this story of the, of the drones. You know these drones were acquired for the specific purpose of fighting illegal mining. How true is it from what we're hearing? Hello, Doc. Unfortunately, we, we lost Dr. Tonzo there, but the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSRL, Acting Director General, uh, has also been talking about this and the threat that we are faced with, especially with the losing water bodies that we are seeing now. I want to take a look at this. The, the, the turbidity out of the water, but the other heavy metals in the water still remain the same. Now, this produce and thing that I said will come to Accra, will go to any other place. And if we don't take care, we will be sitting here eating, but some of the items will be bioaccumulated with a lot of heavy metals. And if we do not take care, it's going to be very disastrous 
for us. And I think that is why we need as a people to ensure that all that we got to do, we need to do. We look at the health implication, which is just so serious. I mean, you have various uh, premature children, and especially where they use the gold. Sometimes they said that because the gold actually, sometimes you check the water body and you can't find them. You find them down within the river. In fact, uh, CSR Water Research, where I'm the director, we've been doing a lot of research in all, all the river bodies. As I'm We lost uh, Dr. Jamal Tonzoa there. He's uh, a law lecturer at the game bar and also a former legal advisor to Operation Vanguard and also a member of the CSOs that's pushing for these issues that's outlined to be addressed by the president. We'll try to get through us uh, in our subsequent conversations. But this is your election command center. Let's go back to our earlier story where the Electoral Commission of Ghana has announced plans to broadcast the upcoming Interparty Advisory Committee does an IPAC meeting tomorrow live. Dr. Tanko Computer is Deputy Director of Elections and IT for the NDC, joining us on Zoom. Dr. Tanko, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Uh, good evening, Alfred. Let me say good evening to your cherished listeners and uh, viewers. I don't know if you've heard that the Electoral Commission has finally they considered that, that call that you made of some of the meetings that you parties have with the commission being broadcast live because tomorrow's IPAC is going to be broadcast live. Uh, very well, yes. I mean, we made the call because of uh, transparency. I mean, the the electoral commission uh, motto is, is transparency. And then so we wanted to uh, give meaning to the transparency, knowing the enormity of the issue at stake. Because when you talk of credible elections, you are referring to credible register. If you don't have a credible register, you cannot talk of credible election. So now that our current register is bedeviled with a lot of discrepancies, and of which the Electoral Commission themselves haven't re responded to our petition that they, they have done some corrections and all that, and invited us to come and then have a look at uh, what they have done and corrected the register. We thought it is it's, it's important to bring along the public uh, uh, with us so that everybody will get to know what is going on because we don't have a different, we don't want to have different information coming out after our behind closed doors meetings, like what happened on the 6th September meeting we had with them. Shortly after that, they came out with different stories. So that's why we're calling for this uh, live broadcast so that after the live broadcast, everybody will know the statue of our register and then the statue of what the NDC has been looking for. I mean, okay. that is the, the reason. That's uh, I, see. Purpose. I see, but there's one request that the commission is making. They say that for those who have identified errors in the PVR, come with a full complement of your errors to the meeting tomorrow. Uh, well, when we get there, we'll cross. But don't forget, we are not moving away from our petition that we sent to them. <laughs> And tomorrow, they will hear from us. Dr. Rashid Tanko, computer, thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. I'm grateful. To remain in your election command center, we're back shortly after this quick break with Manifesto Check. Stay with us. And this is Manifesto Check here on your election command center. We stay the steam on the conversation on illegal mining. Because an existential threat, we are all faced with it. Dennis Kwaberi Wadam is here. What is in the 2016 manifesto of the MPP that you're looking at? Well, I brought this so that we're able to put things in context. Because you know now, there's this call for ban on small-scale mining. So we just decided to backtrack to see how and why this may be um, one of the topical issues now. And why people think that banning small-scale mining would be the way forward to fighting illegal mining. So when you look at the MPP 2020 manifesto, they had made an observation to which they said they were going to push through. Mm -hmm. And in that observation was to the effect that, that it is the MPP's view that artisanal small-scale mining subsector needs restructuring so that its activities can take, the place, can take place within guidelines set under the appropriate regulations. Mm. 
that made it clear that when they come, they were going to regulate this sector, specifically the small-scale mining sector. Right. What did they do when they took over the reins of power in 2017? There was a ban on small-scale mining. Mm -hmm. From January 2017 to December 2018, this may look like a year, but in essence, it's like two years. Mm, that's right. Yes. Right. So the all whole of 2017. Yes. And the whole of 2018. 2018. Okay. There was ban on small scale mining. Why did they do this? They did this because they wanted to achieve what they had promised in their 2016 manifesto. That is to restructure the activities in there. Around this period of time, mm -hmm. There was a lot of vetting of the licenses of those who were holding licenses to mine in the small scale industry. So, this space of time allowed them to put in measures that, in their view, were fit to regulate the space. That's right. Now, mm. fast forward in 2020, they themselves highlighted what they said were successes of this thing that they did between 2017 and 2018. That is the ban on small-scale mining mm -hmm. and, and then the restructuring of the whole system, putting in place the necessary regulations that needed to be put in place. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the 2020 manifesto, you find a portion where they said what the promise was, which is the, to combat illegal mining, Galamsey, and then what they had done. And this is what they had done that they placed a moratorium on small-scale mining. The moratorium was lifted only after implementing a structured, tightly regulated strategy, the, communi the community mining program. And they go on and on and talking about the alternative livelihood program and all that. What this means is that they themselves have admitted that by virtue of what they had done in 2017 and 2018, mm -hmm. It was something worth highlighting in their 2020 manifesto. So when you come from this background, mm -hmm. you can begin to appreciate the, the position of organized labor and all those who are calling for ban on small-scale mining. Because there's some precedent. Because there's a precedent. Right. But there mm -hmm. seemed to be an opposition to this proposal by organized labor, even though it's not obviously being stated, but there's, there seemed to be some opposition. Because, for instance, there are many who say that in the midst of it all, the president has had bigger platforms where he could mention this, but he did not state exactly what he intends to do as regards that call. Mm. That's by the fact that he set up a five-member committee to look into that. But, That's of course, right. many thought that, I mean, with the bar conference, the recent one be the GJ uh, Awards night, he had the opportunity to say a thing or two about whether or not he's in for the ban. Mm -hmm. But his ministers, especially the sector ministers, have been making comments that seem to suggest that the government really is not enthused about going back to what they had done in the previous years, but we were banning it. This was the Lands and Natural uh, Resources Minister. Just a day after organized labor had threatened to go on um, demonstration if their demands were not met. Mm -hmm. Part of his speech or his uh, presentation that day said something along the lines of that even if they ban small-scale mining, the illegal small-scale miners. In essence, what he sought to say by this was that banning small-scale mining is not the solution to the problem we are dealing with now. I see. So, the, the, so this is not really going to be Yes, that there's no guarantee if we ban small-scale mining. The illegal miners, the, the illegal small-scale miners will, not, will still not persevere or persist. So I am reluctant to give a definitive position on this matter. Now, his deputy, he was quite categorical. Yeah. He said, I have heard organized labor making calls to ban all forms of mining, but I want to say the call on the, on the ban on mining is misdirected. And now, organized labor is not calling for ban on mining. Organized labor is calling for ban on small-scale mining. Right. Just over the weekend, there was another. This is Dr. Ayuafiye. Yeah, he's MP for Edusi also correct. Yes, he's also the campaign coordinator for the middle bed for Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. My son is the chair of one of the and oh, very, very important committees of parliament. George Mekuduka is also the campaign coordinator for 
the Baumia campaign team for the mining communities. Now, let's get back to this. Even though uh, Dr. Efriye has come to clarify that his use of the word here, Galamsi, he meant small scale mining. Granted, even if he meant small scale mining, it still comes back to the point that there seemed to be an opposition from members of the government to the call for the ban on small scale mining. So, even if you replace the, your, the Galamsi by small scale mining, what he's in essence saying that we will not stop small scale mm -hmm. mining today. We will not stop small scale money tomorrow. That part wasn't doctored. Yes, but okay. it's important to note that these are members of the same government who saw it necessary to place a ban on small scale mining for two good years so, to do what they thought was appropriate to streamline the industry. So why not? Now we've come back to a point where we haven't seen that the water bodies are even more polluted than before. We've seen a lot of um, coal. I think the last time I attempted to count, I counted right. as many as 20, more than 20 actually, mm -hmm. groups that are calling for, I mean, a decisive uh, action to be taken in this particular space. But then again, as we always say, the verdict... is with the people. It's with the people indeed. And look, Dennis, you, you look good today. Thank you. And thanks to Bondana for clothing me. As always. And on behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. Make a date same time tomorrow. Do have a good night. I am Alfred Akansi.